Welcome back, fellow jazz bums. Today, we are so excited to have Dylan from Noble Records here. We are huge fans of Dylan. Whenever Dylan drops a video, especially a jazz video, it is a must watch for the three of us. Um, so we are so excited to have you here. Before we get into it, remember to like and subscribe. We're going to drop a link to the Jazz Bums Discord if you want to come hang out there. And we live stream every Friday night, so come check us out there as well. With that, I'm going to kick it over to Felipe to get us started. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. Welcome back to the channel. So today we have Dylan Smith from Noble Records in Matthews, North Carolina. Noble Records uh, started around 2010 as a group of collectors. They wanted to find rescue records from basements, attics, closets, garage, as he self describes. And now he's been focusing mostly on making those records available to people, either uh, on the store, online, um, with a huge internet presence. Uh, Dylan has a very successful channel that's actually so successful we had to split it. And he's also starting his own um, reissue series campaign, a very hard to find, sought after, uh, mostly rock, prog, uh, obscurities that are really cool, collectible, great, great music. And he's making those available to people. You know, he's been just a great, great internet presence and also a good jazz collector, as we know. And we're going to discuss that kind of a little more deeper today. So, Dylan Smith. Thank you so much for joining us today from North Carolina. We truly appreciate it. I hope you, we, we had a, a good time today. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm not notoriously a jazz guy, but I do I dabble. So I'm probably not as first as you guys are, or your viewers are, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk about what I know. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, man. Um, so can you just talk maybe to start off with, like, how, how did you get into jazz to begin with? I guess growing up, I always thought jazz was like old people music, you know, like I envisioned jazz as just like, I didn't know what jazz was, you know, really. I mean, I, I the only thing I knew of jazz is I thought like Frank Sinatra was jazz, which, you know, your viewers, I, I don't think that anymore, <laughs> but, but that's what I thought at the time, you know? And then, uh, I don't know when I was probably 16, um, I was at the library at my school looking through the CDs that they had a bunch of CDs donated. I worked in the library at my public school that I, that I went to and somebody had donated a Miles Davis CD and I don't even know what it was. It wasn't, I think it was like a compilation or something. And I started listening to it and I was really, you know, I'm just, it's the only, I was like, well, I know Miles Davis is jazz. So anyways, and so through the years, I always kind of tried to get into it, but I mean, from the beginning I've been, I'm a guitar player. So uh, blues is a lot easier to play than jazz is. Uh, <laughs> you know, I can play blues, but jazz, I could never wrap my head around how to do it. But anyways, um, fast forward 10 years or whatever, and I started getting into jazz. Um, you know, I had picked up at different places, yard sales, thrift stores, stuff like that. Uh, some jazz records like, you know, soft serve stuff, Duke Ellington, things like that. And then um, I went to go buy some records at a guy's house and he he posted something on craigslist back then you could use craigslist now it's kind of a crap shoot you can't really use it anymore um but i went to this guy's house he said he had some records for sale and i walk in and he opens up a door to his spare bedroom and it was seven thousand records it was more records than i have in this room it was an unbelievable amount of records and uh he was like hey I, i'm not letting you cherry pick you gotta buy them all and i was like i can't afford it. i had like 200 bucks to my name and um, I just said, I started looking through them and he's like, he's like, I'll take 200 bucks. That's fine. I just need them out because I'm moving. This was in 2010 ish. And uh, I just said, I closed my eyes. I said, if I could pick one record out that I know what it is and I like it, I'll buy the whole thing. I just, I don't know why I did it that way, but I reached out and pulled out. Um, it was uh, Duke Ellington and John Coltrane, that record. And I had been listening to it online. Oh, yeah. But I didn't, I never listened to it on vinyl, you know, but I wanted it. I really like that was that on top of my want list. I really wanted that record. And it was just happened to be the one I pulled really out. Good. And it was that collection was an absolute life changer for me. Um, I learned so much music through that. There was a bunch of jazz in there. There was a bunch of punk blues. The guy had a record store in the 80s and it shut down and he brought all his inventory home. That's where it came from. So anyways, that, that was kind of the birth of Noble Records it was also kind of my birth of discovering jazz and i've always kind of been intimidated by it because i know it's a huge world of stuff like i mean i'm really into the obscure rock and all that stuff but jazz is 
it's the same. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of different players. There's different pressings. It's intimidating for somebody that my brain doesn't typically bend towards jazz. Um, and I think I've kind of gotten a back door to jazz through like funk and then like, you know, Herbie Hancock. And then, you know, you kind of boil it down. So anyways, I love John Coltrane. Obviously that was kind of my, um, I really like Miles Davis. I really like, um, I liked, uh, Thelonious Monk. I took a jazz course in college. Oh, really? uh, so I kind of got, you know, inundated with a lot of that stuff then. But, um, just through the years, I think when I buy a collection, I see it as an opportunity of like learning whatever genre that person was into. So mm -hmm. like if it's a metal collection, you know, I get in, I'll, I will be listening to metal for a month just to kind of wrap my head around what that person was into. I learned, I've, I've learned so much that way. A lot of people are like, how do you learn about all these really rare, obscure records? It's like, I just find, I get, I get thrown down these rabbit holes every time I, get a jazz collection or, or blues collection or funk collection or whatever. And so through the years, I've bought a bunch of collections that are that way that are jazz. And then every time I do, I just get like lasered into jazz for a few months. And so now like I have a pretty decent, it's a passable jazz collection. You know, I should have picked out some of my big ones to show you, but um, so I, I collect, you know, what everybody collects, blue notes, prestige, stuff like that. I love uh, black jazz, strata East strata. I love um, stuff like that. So I collect the originals and then I really love the analog productions stuff as I've upgraded my sound system. Just analog productions has been um, where I like to spend a lot of my money on reissues. <laughs> anyway, I got a good relationship with them. We stock them in the shop, all that stuff. So that's kind of, I guess that's a lot, that's a lot for your first question, but that's kind of how, I've gotten into jazz. Um, I got really heavy into it maybe three years ago. I mean, it's been a little bit at a time, but like mm -hmm. I think it was probably three years ago. So this guy brings in a stack of records in the shop and it's maybe that many records and it's all garbage. Like just okay. junk, mm -hmm. junk, junk. I don't even want throw out the trash junk. And uh, right in the middle is this first, Ooh. first mono beautiful. I mean, Beautiful, beautiful, Ooh. beautiful copy. Um, you pull it out. It is super clean. I mean, I, you can't really tell, but it is super clean. First mono. And this is, at the time, number one on my want list, right? Wow. I see it and my jaw drops. I'm like. <laughs> and so, you know, you always have the debate. Do I tell him? You know, do, do, I, do I say, hey, you know. Yeah. And I. I'm the kind of person I am. I could not live with myself if I didn't tell him, you know, and I said, where did these, where'd these records come from? He's like, they're my dad's. And, you know, he kind of was a record collector and I just try to get rid of these. Just let me know what you, what you think. And I was like, man, this is all junk, but this one is worth <laughs> a lot of money. And I thought I just was hundred percent honest with him. And I just, I just felt like, you know, through the years when I've bought collections and, and sold things and interact with people. I always go out and get a lot better off if I treat people with respect and I'm just honest because people understand you got to make money. You know, people understand mm -hmm. that usually. So anyways, I just kind of told him what it was worth, what I'd give him for it. And he kind of smiled. He said, I was testing you and you passed. Now you can look <laughs> at the rest of the collection. <laughs> oh, wow. He brings me over to his house and he has just, I mean, bang! I mean, every single jazz record at the time I could even imagine. I mean, it was mm -hmm. incredible stuff. Some of it I had to sell because I, I needed the money for the shop at the time. But I mean, I got an original first press saxophone Colossus, original um, Lee Morgan Cooker, um, like all the original first press uh, Herbie Hancock's, like the early Blue Note stuff. Um, Miles Davis, Waltz for Debbie. It was in the shrink. It was perfect. Um, I had like a bunch of um, it was stuff from like really rare stuff, um, really like jazz, funk, avant-garde stuff. I mean, his, ja his dad was just an insane collector. So, I mean, when I saw it, I was like mind blown and I, you know, bought everything, obviously. And uh, that was so that's when I really got heavy into it because I was like, all right, I'm seeing and some of the ones I sold from that collection. I very deeply regret, but that's how it is. Sometimes you can't keep them all. But uh, mm -hmm. so anyway, that's just kind of that was a few years ago. And that's when I started. 
I kind of gave up and was like, all right, I'll start collecting jazz now. Cause <laughs> I, you know, jazz records are worth money. And over the years um, I'm like, I'll go crazy on rock, but I don't know if I want to jump in the deep end with jazz. Cause it's so expensive, you know, but I surrendered and now I guess I'm a jazz collector a little bit. So, <laughs> so, uh, so obviously you make your living from selling records. Um, and you have done this for, for quite a while now, all different types of iterations. And I would assume that that knowing, you know, pressing variants within jazz and all the kind of the details to be able to identify what press what pressing it is um, to us to assign the, the correct value to it is something of a necessity. And I'm sure that that extends through all genres and all records. Um, so what so when did like the like the the kind of the technical understanding of what the record is and kind of the valuation of it with your kind of passion for for jazz um which which you which you um developed when did those marry were you were you kind of um aware of of kind of jazz records what they were what you know how you know how to how to treat them and then kind of later on you you kind of developed um an interest within the music as well or did it kind of come together and, and happen at the same time well owning a shop you kind of got to know what everything's worth whether you like it or not you know there's records that i get that are worth a ton of money that i don't give a crap about you know but uh <laughs> but there's with jazz stuff i mean I, I have friends that collect um and so i always kind of you know i know what they're worth you know i, I look it up and, and kind of see and all that stuff and it's the only genre that's ever been that way for me but i just kind of hesitated to get into it because i know how deep of a hole it is, you know? So I guess like what you're asking is like, no, did I know what the value was? Like I, I, I always, if there's anything that's rare or whatever, I'll do a lot of research to know like what they're worth, what a fair price is, all that stuff. Jazz is really tricky because you can't look at discogs for the rare ones. You can't like the original first press discogs is, is not a good resource for, for original like blue note jazz stuff because a lot of them that come up are trashed. Mm -hmm. um, and so that tanks the value of that Discogs median. And then also, like, I was talking to a friend about this the other day. And this goes with any rare record, whether it's jazz or psych or whatever. Um, wh whatever record it is, if it's our super rare record that, like, once in a lifetime type of deal, um, a lot of that stuff gets traded hands privately. Like, a lot of people won't sell it online. Like... Um, you know, there's, uh, like I have this fraction Moonblood. this record is almost my favorite record of all time. You know, that record, I, you know, online, I think the Discogs median is like around a thousand dollars, but I know people that have privately bought them for $12,000 that are really clean because, but that's the stuff doesn't hit the internet very much. Yeah. So like, I know jazz collectors that are friends of mine, there's certain blue notes that if you were to get a near mint copy, you can't reference the internet for that. It's just not like, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's, it'll either happen at a record show or more likely than not, you know, if I get a jazz record that's worth $5,000, I got a handful of people that I know will want it. And it, you know how many people that will spend over a thousand dollars on a record? Very few, you know, but I know <laughs> there's a handful of people I can call and they might be interested, you know? Um, and then that's not going to be on the internet anywhere. So you kind of got to know. Um, and unfortunately, like when I was first starting out, I, you know, I didn't know that, but as you learn the industry and you learn the market and stuff like that, you kind of get a grasp for what things should go for, how rare certain things are, you know, and I'm talking about 90% of records. Discogs is a great indicator of what they're worth because they made a ton of them and there's, they've had a hundred sales in the past year or whatever. Mm -hmm. Some of these jazz records, they don't sell for three years, four years on yeah. Discogs. And by that time, the market has totally changed on them. So, you know, since 2020, and you guys know this better than me, the market on jazz has just <laughs> completely changed. It's insane. So like those black jazz records, like they used to be 30 bucks or whatever. Now they're yeah. 50, 200 bucks sometimes. So some of them, I mean, some of them are cheaper, but, but anyways, all that to say, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do kind of study what things go for. If something hasn't sold for a few years, I ask around, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, um, anyways, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, I, I think th that that's what I suspect as well, especially with, with records that weren't pressed that much when they come up, like in, like an early 1500 series that never comes up. If it, 
if, if you have a near mint copy, like who's to say what that's worth? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, you know, it's, <clears throat> that's a really desirable record. And, you know, at auction, who knows what somebody would, would bid it up for. So, so yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm reading. So, uh, Jill, one question I was asking myself and uh, debating here with them, you're really heavy into like Prague and, uh, you know, stuff like that. And a lot of jazz musicians, they, they record bands like this, especially in Europe and Germany, you know, getting to know those recordings and the jazz guys in there that give like an extra push towards jazz or get you to know more familiar with many musicians there. How, how did that work for you? Um, it's funny how of a fine line it is between like between Prague and jazz, you know, um, some things that you might think, my shoot, is this, is this a jazz rock or is this Prague? It's so close. But like, I think the first one for me was Ian Carr and Nucleus. Those are, those records are so good, you know, and they're on, yeah. they're on Vertigo, you know, so the Vertigo label, I'm all over that stuff. And so I didn't even know Ian Carr was a jazz musician, you know, <laughs> really. I, mm -hmm. I just, you know, when I first found that record, I was just mind blown by it. But then, you know, there are a lot of guys that kind of crossed over and did different things like that. And that's incredible to me. I also love like, you know, um, like, you know, obviously Herbie Hancock with Headhunter stuff. And then um, you know, all those old school musicians that would break off and do like the crazy funk albums and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Oliver Nelson's stuff, like like the um, Skull Session records. Yep. Stuff like that. I love stuff like that. I think you see a lot more of that type of stuff to where, you know, they were crossing over and doing more like funk fusion type stuff which those records are just insane. I love that. But um, but also, yeah, with Prague, I mean, there's a lot of that going on too. And that's the beauty of it. Like I really like certain yeah. musicians, they seem to go their own way, like a certain, you know, Coltrane, um, John and Alice both kind of went the more avant-garde spiritual jazz way. And then you got like, you know, Herbie Hancock wins the more like funk, type of way and then you know certain musicians go in different i mean lord knows where miles davis would have gone if he had lived a little bit longer um and um i guess uh you know he did some pretty crazy out there stuff um what i meant to say is you know there's there's rumors that miles davis was planning to do a record with Jimi hendrix and stuff like that you know oh, wow. I've heard mm -hmm. that. I don't know if it's true, but that that yeah. would be crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, he was actually yeah he was actually teaching him to read music. Yeah, so Lord yeah. knows what would happen. That's what I meant to say. But Lord knows what would have happened if that had actually come to fruition. But anyways, but yeah, that's what I love about music is it can it can really flow in crazy directions right. sometimes. Which is great. So yeah, yeah. Because my, my local here, they got a bunch of like brain uh from the brain label, Germany. Mm -hmm. That stuff is crazy. It's so it good. Right? Yeah. And a lot of jazz musicians there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you talked about um, you know, how you got into jazz and all that. Well, for me, you were actually instrumental in me kind of getting into jazz. I mean, I'd I'd bought a couple of jazz records and I hit YouTube looking for for, uh, you know, resources, and you were on one of the first that came up. I remember you did a video, I think it's like in 2020, probably like the top top 10 essential jazz records or you know, records to start a collection with. Um, so can you talk about like the YouTube channel and like how that started and 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 you know how it's gotten so big and that sort of sort of stuff? Yeah, it's crazy, man. I don't, I mean. <laughs> I mean, I don't, it's not, I never thought it would happen like this. I, I didn't plan for it to happen like this at all. I'm not the type of person um, that wants to have a huge channel and all that stuff. It's just never been, I never wanted to be on the internet. <laughs> but like, you know, when I first started Noble Records up until 2018, I think in 2018, I posted the first picture of my face. So like I always did everything anonymously. You didn't know what I looked like. You didn't know who I was, all that stuff. And I had an Instagram page before that. And I think I'd gotten up to like 10,000 followers on Instagram, which back then was a lot. Now yeah. everybody's stepdaughter or whoever will have 10,000 just for nothing. You know, but it's a huge, like back then that was a pretty big deal. So I had a pretty good um, network of people that would buy records from me and things like that. And then when I started doing like pop-ups, 
around locally. I was like, I'll advertise, you know, locally. And then I started posting like pictures of what we did. And then I was in some of the pictures and stuff like that. And then like I was watching YouTube videos from a bunch of different guys that was doing stuff about psych and stuff like that. And I was like, I think I want to do it just because I don't have any friends that collect records at all. And at the time, I didn't even know anybody who collected records. And I was like, I would love to interact with other people, have some sort of community in this, because in my world, I'm weird. I'm still kind of weird. Mm-hmm. But the, the but as far as like mm-hmm. now I'm able to support a family with records, back then it wasn't that way. I'm, I was I kind of like people would come over to the house and be like, what are all these records? This is weird. So anyways, so I started making videos and it was doing okay. I guess I didn't really care about the subscribers and all that. And then in 2020, when um, the crap hit the fan and we had to shut the shop down, uh, we shut it down for, I guess it was like two or three months. I didn't know it was going to be that way, but I'm not the type of person that will just sit on my hands and see what happens. So I was like, during these few weeks to where I'm, I'm kind of, I got the shop shut down. Um, I'm going to try to pump up YouTube. I think at the time I had, uh, I think I had like 5,000 subscribers, which at the time I thought, I mean, it was a lot. I was like, man, my YouTube's really cranking up and I was monetizing and I was getting a little bit of money from ads. But when I say I was making from money from ads, I think I was making a hundred bucks a month or something. Yeah. It wasn't like a lot. And so I was like, I got to figure out how to make some money, do something. So I decided to do like, I tried to do a video every day, oh, and, wow. you know, which I didn't do, but I tried, that was my goal is to do one every day. I ended up doing like, I don't know, three or four a week. Mm-hmm. And just to try to get some traction with something. I didn't know that was only, mm-hmm. I was stuck at home. So that's the only thing I really knew to do. And I figured, okay, I'm, I'm at home with nothing to do. So is everybody else. They're going to be watching YouTube. If I can make good videos, I might be able to build this thing a little bit. And that was my only, uh, that was my only idea. I just felt like, you know, this is the one time everybody's taking a break. If I can work really hard during this time, maybe that'll launch me forward a little bit. That was my, that was my goal. So I was making some videos. Some of them sucked. And then one day I made this stupid video that should not have done well. (laughs) It's like not even a good video of mine. But I woke up and, and I was asleep one night and I thought, um, you know, there's a tab on Discogs that says most collected or most wanted. And what if I did a video of the top most wanted records? That's what I decided to do because it, it seemed like a d- decent video idea. So I actually got up from out of bed. I went out to my room. I, p- I had all the records. I picked them out. I did the video. Went back to bed. I posted it, went back to bed, woke up the next morning, and it was doing pretty good. And it just kept going and never stopped. And it's at like two and a half million or something now. I don't know. Wow. Which, which is wow. why it's not a good video, but it's just <laughs> you never know. Um, I go back and watch it and kind of cringe a little bit, but um, you mm-hmm. never know what's going to take off. And you got to throw a bunch at the wall and see what sticks, you know? And that's that one. I think that week I got 20,000 subscribers in one week because it was, it just took off. And so I did a couple videos after that, that also kind of took off, but not like that one. And so since then, YouTube has just been weird. Uh, There's certain times to where I'll really try and nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. And there's certain times I won't really try and a bunch of stuff will happen. It's just kind of, so I decided rather than try really hard, work really hard at it, I think what people really like to see on YouTube mm-hmm. is um, people talking about what they love. I think that it really boils down to that. I love records. It's just, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. <laughs> I'm talking about cool records that I really like. And uh, when they come around, uh, you know, and I think, you know, uh, there's so many cool records out there that nobody has any idea that were ever made that people put their heart and soul into making and that never really got any recognition. And so my goal is to kind of put that stuff back out there. Um, and you know, people, I think some people are fine with listening to the same 10 records their whole life. Yeah. I'm not the kind of person. I got to listen to a different record every day. I just, yeah. and so for people like that, I think mm-hmm. it's just essential to know where to look to find records. I mean, even if you don't have the album in your hand, you know, to find Mm -hmm. uh, what to listen to, where to go, all that stuff. So I don't know. That's just kind of what I've done over the years. And it has 
seem to resonate with people and people really like it. And, you know, now the YouTube channel is really good for that. And now as I'm trying to do the record label and sell on exclusives and things like that, there's a, a base of people that care about what I'm doing, which is everything. So um, yeah. I don't think I would be able to do a label or these exclusives or anything like that if I didn't have people that cared about what I care about, which is huge for me. So mm-hmm. I'm very grateful that that is um, that has happened for me. So anyways, I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that work a lot harder on their videos <clears throat> and do a lot better videos than I do. And for whatever reason, they don't they they don't get to a hundred thousand subscribers, um, which sucks because I think they make great videos. I don't know what it is. I don't I don't really know, but it's it's been fun. I try to have fun with it, and that's. Well, I think. Awesome. Oh, Felipe, do you want to jump in? No, just um, actually, it's one thing I was thinking to myself, Dylan. I think um, you're a very uh, knowledgeable person, so people want to hear what you have to say, but you're also doing a very approachable way. You know what I mean? Okay. It, it just feels like someone is hanging out at uh, the couch or at the shop or in, in a bar, having a beer and chatting about. So I think you make that very relatable. And uh, you have a, a good character, a good personality on, on the screen, I think, you know. Yeah. But, uh, my, yeah, I can go ahead uh, for later. I just wanted to ask you how is the the release process, how those titles are picked, who you partnership with, and how the, proce- how the whole process is. Um, yeah, let's get into that. Well, first of all, thank you. I try to do that. I, I think I've always been really overwhelmed when you talk to different record collectors and musicians and people with sticks up their butts. They seem like they have a, a kind of a smoke screen in front of them that they're trying to talk complicated. So you think they know more. You know what I'm talking about? And and they're hard. It's oh, yeah. kind of hard. And I don't know that it's even if they even know they're doing it or maybe they're not doing it on purpose, but, uh, but, and you're like, wow, that's a way over my head. I'm tossing that knowledge out. But the way my approach is, is I really, the more I find out is the more I don't know. Like I, the more I'm like, man, there's a lot out there. I have no idea. So I always try to come to everything with an open ear, willing to learn. There's people that have been collecting for one year. They tell me something that I never knew. And there's people that have been collecting their whole lives that tell me something I don't know. So it, it's, it's foolish to turn a blind eye or ear to anybody because there's so much out there. There's so much knowledge out there. I mean, everybody has different experiences. And so the more people feel equipped and knowledgeable about records, the longer this thing is going to stick around and the more good reissues we're going to get and the more the community is going to thrive. And for a bunch of old curmudgeons that guard our information and don't tell anybody anything, then the next generation is not going to care about it. You know what I mean? So my whole goal is that when I'm 90 years old, I can still collect records and it means something. You know what I mean? There's still a community. So anyways, that's why I do it. You said uh, label releases. So it all started with, I found this record. The exclusives, a lot of people think that the exclusives are my label. It's, it's, it's not the same thing. So the exclusives are, that started a few years ago um, when... So let's say there's a label that has an album that I really would love to release, but they already have the rights to it. They're already pressing it. Mm-hmm. If I want to make it available to my customers or whatever, and it's unique to me, I will say, hey, you know, you're putting out this record. Do you mind if um, if we do a limited edition color colorway for my shop and my customers? And then, so like, for instance, the first time it happened was this Randy Holden population Two. This is... A super rare, um, heavy rock, uh, early 70s. It's, they say it's the dawn of, uh, of doom, stoner, metal type stuff. Anyways, this is one of my favorite records of all time. I met Randy Holden and did an interview for him, for my podcast when I used to have a podcast with him. And he kind of talked about wanting to re-release it. And I thought to myself, man, I would love to, to re-release that record. But that was in like, I think 2019 or early 2020. I can't remember. And I just did not have the resources to do that. It needed to be good. And I did not know what the heck to do. So Mm -hmm. um, I told them I would try to find somebody that I thought would do a good job. Um, I have a friend, his name's Daniel. Um, He runs Riding Easy Records. Great dude. 
And I just contacted him. I said, I think this would be a really good release for you. I hate to just give it away, but it just needs to be done well. And I don't have the resources to do that at the time. I mean, at the time, the shop had just opened. I was barely scraping by. I don't even know that the shop was open at that point. I think it was. Anyways, so I handed it to him. He did it. And then, you know, we had we came up with this idea to do um, an exclusive just for my customers. So at least I was kind of getting something out of it. So we did 200 copies on yellow vinyl for, for us and put them up for pre-order. And they sold out that day, you know. Oh, wow. So that was the first one that we ever did was this one. We did another one after that with them called Ice. Then same deal with this record. This is Farm. Um, this is a record I looked for for 15 years. Couldn't find. It was my most wanted record. The re They had some reissues and the reissues were going for like 300 bucks. Um, and I didn't even think about doing, I, I didn't have, the label wasn't really in my mind at the time, but I, I knew that the label Garrison was um, going to be reissuing it. So I reached out to them. I said, hey, I got a YouTube channel, record store. Could we do 300 copies on Yellow Vinyl? And they're like, sure. So the what's in it for them is that they get to sell another 300 records. Mm -hmm. What's in it for me is I get those wholesale to sell to my customers. Everybody makes money. Everybody's happy. It's great. So they did those for me. They sold out in an hour. The first time mm -hmm. I did this one, they sold out in an hour. It what's, was what's the... Is, is that still in print, the Noble Records version, or is that done? No. The, no. Well, so those sold out in an hour. We did it again on a solid gold. Those okay. sold out in an hour. We did it again <laughs> on a transparent yellow. Those sold out like within the day. And now you can get them on black vinyl. They're around. But there could be yeah. another Noble Records reissue of it eventually, maybe. What's the, what's the aftermarket on those? Are they going for a lot of money? <laughs> Mine? Um, I don't know. I mean, they, they'll go, they go for... I think now they're going for like 60 bucks or something like that. You know, when originally they're like 32, but okay. you know, it, that's how it is with anything. Anything sells out, people go online and try to find them and then get it for cheap or whatever. But that, so the exclusives have been going like that. Um, and they've been going really well. Generally they would sell out and people would be like, why didn't you make more of them? I'm like, well, dude, cause I got to pay for this stuff up front. You know, it's <laughs> exactly. stupid. And so, um, we started doing 500. We did, uh, there's now I'm called orangutan. We did a thousand of those and they sold out within like a week, um, which was great. And so now we do anywhere between 300 to a thousand, depending on the title, depending on what I think they'll go for, um, like, or how fast they'll, they'll sell out, you know, and certain things like I, I want to have available because I get new viewers all the time. And they're like, there's nothing on your website. I'm like, yeah, you, gotta, you know, so anyways, and so I always wanted to kind of do a label um, so yeah. I could kind of be in control of the stuff, how I wanted to do it. And um, it just because it's something that I was passion project for me, I'd like to do. And it was always kind of in the back of my mind that one day I'll probably do that. Um, maybe two years ago, um, a friend of mine found this record at a yard sale. It's called Underground Fire. It's from Monroe, North Carolina, which is where I grew up as a kid. Um and, and it's right ne like right next door to our shop. It's very close by. And he, my friend brought this in and he said, Hey dude, have you ever heard this? And I was like, never seen that in my life. I would remember that looks awesome. <laughs> so we listened to it and it was just like incredible, like, gar like garage rock, fuzz guitar solos. It's like what I'm really into. And um, I tracked down the guys that are in the band and they said they'd be open to a reissue it's a long story. Another label got involved and tried to snake it out from under us, but we kind of had to stand our ground and, and uh, they actually, it was, it was crazy. There's a lot of shady labels out there, but for, anyway, for, for that release, would it, would, would that be a needle drop or do you, do they have so the, the, here's the, the, deal. the tapes are gone for this. Yeah. So yeah. some things have to be needle drop. And I know yeah. that a lot of people are like, a lot of people are so vehemently against it. They're like, you might as well not put it out. But the thing no. is, you'll never hear no this way. record. Like This yeah. record is so rare. They only ever made a few hundred copies. I live in North Carolina, and I've only ever seen two copies. And so um, I bought a really clean copy from the, one of the band members so we could do the transfer. We sent okay. it to probably the best mastering engineer for needle drops in the country. Um, he did a tremendous job on it. The masters are up now. You can stream this. This this was never online anywhere. There was no YouTube rip, no nothing of it before we found it. 
And so you can stream this now on all streaming platforms and it's going to come out on vinyl um, sometime this year. We're still working on it. The pressing plant that we were working with ended up shutting down. So we had to go to another one. This one's kind of been hard to get done. But anyways, this was the one, you know, we licensed it from the band. We we're working with them. They come in the shop all the time. It's a great way to start because with private press stuff like this, it's easier to license than like, you know, trying to do a John Coltrane record or something like that. So um, <laughs> this has been great. And then um, I thought, well, what's the next record I'd really like to do? Because I want to do local stuff like North Carolina stuff. This is a record called Dry Water. Um, this is a really heavy rock record. Originals of this are going for 700 bucks or so. Really rare, really heavy, really good. Um, like I think anybody would like this record. It's fantastic. And um, most of the people in this rec that on this in this band had passed away. I was able to track down um, the lady who owns the rights to this, which was the lead singer's wife, who was also in the band. She was great to work with, a lot of fun. She still lives locally. We were able to get the original master tapes for this. Cool. I've not told anybody this, but I guess I'll just tell you. Um, mm. Don't tell anybody. But uh, <laughs> we ended up uh, getting this mastered. Um, at analog productions. So analog productions, oh, wow. the whole thing, triple a, you know, straight. Oh, fantastic. From That's awesome. Yeah. And so also what's also cool on it is that on the master tapes, there was a track. There's a couple tracks that were cut short when they put it on the record that were like had longer jam, like versions of it that were on the tape. And there's one track that they never put on the album for whatever reason It's incredible. So all that's going to be on streaming and it's all going to be on my release that we do. And like I said, it has been done from the original master tapes and everything is like triple a incredible. So I've got the test pressings for this. Very it's, cool. It's going to be that great. Is awesome. been, the next one, I'm not, this is the last one I'll show you. So it's called yes. yes to Urfa. This is like a $2,500 record. It's super, super rare. Um, it's a prog album, lots of synthesizer stuff. I mean, look how crazy it looks. Um, <clears throat> this is one, um, another one that I really wanted to do. I reached out to the band. They there hasn't been a reissue in like many years. The reissues go for like 150 bucks on this one. So um, they ended up sending me the master tapes, and those have also been done by Analog Productions. Um, and it's been uh, it's been great. So Analog Productions is doing both of those. They're pressed at QRP, 180 gram, all that um, mastered straight from the tapes, AAA. And so I'm really pleased with it. It's been great to work with them. Chad um, has become a really, really good friend of mine. He's helped me out a lot as I've kind of started out. Um, is there is there an engineer? Is that Matthew Luthens? I think his name is. Is, is that who's on those? Awesome. Like yeah. So uh, a lot of people you deal with want to get it done and get paid. Yeah. Um, which they obviously want to do, but Matt will not do it. He will not do it. <laughs> and put his name on it if it is not tops. I mean, he has that. Yeah. He has that perfect. And there's been a couple of times, like we already did one. There's two different test pressings of dry water. Uh, it's a long story, but the first one wasn't just right. And so we went around and did it again. So um, I'm, I've got the test pressings at some sort of point. I'll probably sell some of them, but, um, but the first one, uh, the tapes, we had some issues with the tapes, so we had to restore the tapes. So the first one that we did was a needle drop and he really worked very hard to get the tapes, um, done the right way and everything like that. So, um, he's been great. He's, like I said, I guess that's how you, that, that you get a good reputation in the business, but I'm telling you, he's done things that I would have not ever thought to do because he knows it's going to sound better. And he's went to great lengths to make sure that it sounds as good as it can go. And that's what Analog Productions does. They're great, fantastic yeah. label, fantastic um, pressing facility, all that stuff, top of the line. I mean, some people don't care about that. And that's the thing, like with psych records and prog records and with jazz records, it's a given. Everybody wants it to sound great. The psych and prog records, for some reason, a lot of labels, they skimp out and they do a cheap pressing and they just try to get it done. But yeah. there's not a whole lot of audiophile psych, you know, like um, – uh, Mike from the Ingroove did that Wild Times record, yeah. and it's fantastic. He put a lot of work into it. It's incredible, and uh, that was great. But outside of that, there's not a whole lot of that going on. So I'm really excited to work with them. And uh, there's a, there's a few other records that we're putting out this year as well. Uh, there's George Brigman Jungle Rot, which is um, 
we didn't have the tapes for that one, but that's a really good one. That's like a thousand dollar record at least. Um, the original. So anyways, my goal is to get this stuff. Most people don't care that much for it to be a first press and pay a thousand dollars for it. But if they can get a 30 to $40 reissue, that sounds really good. They'll be happy. And um, so we just want to do a good job and get good music on people's turntables. So that's kind of how the uh, evolution of the label and exclusives and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. we like this the, the stuff that's on our label, we license that stuff. Everything's done from us. And, um, you know, but the exclusives, we only work with, with people that we, we know are going to do a good job. And so we work a lot with Rod and Easy Records. Daniel at Rod and Easy Records has been, I don't, I wouldn't even have started a label if it hadn't been for him. He's helped me so much with, um, how to do the licensing and how to do everything the right way. And, um, and so him and Chad have both been really, really, really helpful, but there's a lot of labels. We've done it with ancient Greece records and we've done it with, uh, we did one with a, a label called ripple. So anyways, we did one with coal mine records. So that's kind of what we're doing right now and mm -hmm. where that's going. So we have the shop and then we have that. So that's kind of our, our two main sources of, uh, of income. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> I think um, one of the, one of the great things, I mean, just, just seeing what those records you just showed is I think one of the, the great things about your channel is the educational piece of it. And like that farm record, for example, I believe before, before that became um, reissued for noble records, you were, you were talking about that, telling people about it, people were exploring it and, and that created a demand for it so that when it comes out, the people are excited for it and can get a copy. And I think that that's, that's one, you know, one thing that, that the channel is really kind of um, helpful for is kind of for people who, you know, want to learn and, and kind of explore new material. Um, part of your channel is that um, you do a lot of different things. Um, but I think even for me, someone who's extremely focused on jazz, and I love your jazz videos. Um, you know, when you when you go and get like a big punk collection, and you talk about kind of the whole the the whole upfront of how how you were able to get it, you bring it back, and then you do a flip. Like, you know, I'm even interested in that. Or that that one video where you were able to I, I forget I forget the the person's name now, but you recently acquired somebody's collection who used to work in a record shop, and they had like kind of incredible first pressings of of some really rare, like early nineties grunge and other rock stuff. And I, it, so, so like, like I'm not particularly interested in that, but, but the, the fact of like your record um, journey and, and kind of at the level that you're operating and the opportunities you get, the fact that you document those like special moments, um, you know, the, I, I mean, I can keep going on, but I think, I think your channel really um, uh, offers a lot to people, you know, that are, you know, like myself, like I'm, I'm strictly jazz, basically. I mean, I, I dabble a little bit here and there, but even I can appreciate some of the stuff that you're doing. So I just think that's cool. I appreciate it. I, I, I do. Like I said, my main thing is I've thought a lot about, you know, I don't know if you've ever, this is kind of morbid, sorry, but you know, you've ever known somebody who's brilliant musician or just brilliant in one way or the other and they pass away and you're like, man, I wish I had what they had in their head. I wish I knew what they knew and it's just gone, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to document as much as I know and try to pass that along um, while I can, you know, I mean, and so when I'm gone, I don't know if YouTube, um, uh, who's going to go first, me or YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> gone, I want my kids to be able to watch my videos and stuff. Sometimes I watch videos from like three years ago and I'm like, man, I forgot all about that, you know, so I can learn <laughs> learn from myself if I because <laughs> I forget so much but but anyways I just um my main goal in doing the videos is to keep the community going and keep people excited about it and it's job security for me but it's also like you know um I, I don't know a lot of people come up to me and they they say really nice things and it means something to people and that that means a lot to me. It's crazy that me talking about records would mean anything to anybody, but um, but it does, and I, I really am grateful that people care what I have to say. So, anyways, thank you for the kind words. You know, related to that though, these records you're putting out are kind of the same thing. You're actually forwarding these people's legacy, whether they're they're here now or not. I mean, the, these you know super rare records that no one's ever heard, 
you're getting a thousand copies out in the world, you know, for people that have been to, been to get into. And I think that's pretty amazing. Well, that's, that's, that's my goal. I do. I, I love doing it and like, I'm um, getting people excited and reintroducing things, you know, and there's so many bands that are making music that sucks that they don't even need to be made. And, and people they're putting it out there, putting it out there, putting it out there. Um, but there's so many musicians also on the other side that, that made great music in the past. And for whatever reason, they got a bad deal from the record label or, or, or whatever. And it just never came out. And so um, it's good for everybody to kind of reintroduce that stuff out, but that's just, that's what I'm into. I would love to do more jazz like that. I just haven't found, I haven't found much of that, you know, I mean, um, most of the, the blue note jazz era, like blue note prestige, it's such a special thing and um, so unique to what was going on at the time and all that stuff. It's just almost mm -hmm. impossible to find anything that's even somewhat similar. That's not on like a major label. And for a label, it's really hard to license things from like, for, if I wanted to blue, like license something from a blue note, there's probably no way I could do it, <laughs> you know, um, just because I, I, I'm just, I'm not, at that level is like Chad Kasim does that stuff all the time. He does it in his sleep, but he's been working hard doing that stuff for 30 years, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, but anyways, yeah, we got, I we wish there was in, like that, that I could do as one man. So we got insight into that process. Um, Craig from analog October records over in, in England reissued a jazz record and he, we did an interview with him and he told us about the process and it seemed very, very, you know, challenging for sure. Yeah. Yeah, some are really easy and some are really not, you know, and I've I, there's one record I'm kind of working with doing on a major label and I don't even know that we'll end up getting it done. It's just so difficult and expensive. It's mm -hmm. just the licensing is so expensive with some of that stuff. So I was talking to Chad about it. I don't want to tell you what he said because he I didn't get his permission, but he was kind of telling me like for like a UHQR how much the licensing is for him. And I'm like what <laughs> like it's crazy <laughs> they're making these records and they're 150 dollars and it costs them two dollars to make this record they're pocketing right. the rent that is not what's happening it no. is crazy mm -hmm. but anyways well so. it's got to be getting difficult too because the big labels are figuring out that records are selling again and they're just doing it in-house i mean you got the tone poets and craft you know, the craft the rhino hi-fi series now i mean it's it's mm -hmm. it's hard Right. But like, so this is one thing I want to talk to you guys about, um, which is crazy, but like I'm getting, I'm seeing this trend um, with jazz specifically that like, so uh, in 2020, 1920, but especially during the pandemic, a lot of people jumped into jazz. So mm -hmm. at the time, all the blue notes, were, all the tone poets were selling out. The music matters pressings were, were going through the roof, you know, and there's certain records, um, I mean, it was like everybody was buying everything that every label put out. And it was like, it was crazy. It was insane. Things would sell out. And, and then they, it was just the wild, wild west. You know what I mean? But now everybody is progressing in jazz at the same rate. That's so, what I wanted to ask you. Yeah. As so, a record store owner. Yeah. You're seeing I, it too? Yeah. I don't talk about jazz as much, but I lately have had a lot of people come in the shop and they're selling off their stuff. Um, they're trying to trade those records for a $500 jazz record that's on the wall. Cause they're all getting to that point to where they don't really necessarily want as many reissues as they want original press. It, it's just a natural way that people progress into collecting. So like I had a guy a couple of weeks ago and he brought me a big tub of jazz reissues and he's like, I want $3,000 for this tub record. So I'm like, what? Like, and he's like, look at the Discogs medians and this is the bubble. And I was like, no, nah, dude, this is not because the medians on that stuff are wrong because yeah. there are so many new copies have been put on there and there'll be like 200 copies for sale. So the medium will be 30 bucks, but you look and there's copies for sale for 15 or whatever. Right, right, right. That makes it, that's a really hard dynamic for a shop. So all you jazz guys that are watching, go easy on your local shop if you're trading stuff in. It's just hard because we're getting the same stuff in from all these different customers that are trading things in. And I don't want to say nobody wants it because there's definitely still people that are getting into jazz every day, but there's not as much as demand 
um, as there was because no one could have predicted the wave that was happening at the time and the pressing mm-hmm. plants were at full capacity and, and, and they couldn't keep up with demand. And so now that the pressing plants are like uh, caught up and they're like, we're ready. The demands mm-hmm. kind of dropped off a little bit. Not a ton. I mean, it's not like records aren't valuable anymore, but it's just, it's funny to me how, um, you know, everybody's on their journey but if you got into jazz in 2020 there's a lot of people that are exactly where you are that want the same stuff and have the same stuff that you have so yeah for sure yeah, yeah, yeah. funny but but like um that's been something i've seen happen a lot lately is that people will bring in a bunch of records and they'll look at, they'll put them into like a folder on discogs and they'll say okay the median for this folder is $3000 i'd like to get two thousand dollars and you're like two thousand dollars i'm not making two thousand dollars just because of the reality of the market for this stuff and Mm -hmm. all that it's a very weird phenomenon that's happening but it's all because there was an unnatural boost at one specific like almost one like month (laughs) right you know april 2020 the whole internet broke or or it might have been march or february i don't know uh but and everybody went nuts looking for the same stuff. I don't know what, how, why, why, but it seems like jazz is one genre that just specifically blew up out of freaking nowhere. It's crazy, but yeah. I, well, they, the, I think the, the thing about those records are, I mean, I love reissues. I've got a ton of them, and I'm not going to sell them anytime soon. Um, but oh, wait, wait, wait for uh, a few more years, and then you might. Get I mean, them. maybe. Uh, uh, yeah. But the thing, the thing to me is they're new records, right? Yeah. So yeah. when you go to sell a new record, you're going to get a used price for it. I mean, it's not collectible. They're not rare, mm-hmm. you know. So I've sold like I've sold a couple of classic series like on an auction or whatever on YouTube, and I sold it for fifteen bucks. And I was like, hey, that's sweet. I got fifteen bucks for it. You know, I had it. I listened to it. I was tired of having it. Somebody else got it. You know, yeah, I lost ten bucks on it, but who cares? I mean, that's that's records. Yeah. The people that you're talking about are thinking about this is some special collectible. Like, no, man, they made 10,000 of them. Yeah. Right? yeah. There's, there's 10,000 of them out there. It's and, not. And somebody, somebody comes along and makes a better version. Everybody throws the old version on Discog. <sighs> the market goes yeah. down, and then right. everybody gets that one, and then somebody else makes a better version, and then that one goes down, and then it's just crazy. Um, but you kind of have to – you can get in trouble. You can really get in trouble if you pay too much for that stuff because – First of all, like with a shop, you have people coming in and they're trading in stuff. And I, we really pride ourselves in giving the most that we possibly can for records because we know that everybody's on a budget. But you got people that come in and they want 75% of retail. Yeah, and right. then you got other people coming in and they want a 25% discount. And you're like, wait, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> you get hit at both ends and it's hard to make everybody happy, yeah, but, yeah. but we try. So. <laughs> Now, 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 uh, with with that. So, if you're saying the trend that is that you're seeing is that reissues are coming into the shop more often because people are progressing, whether they're looking for earlier pressings, original pressings, or just things on different labels because they're kind of expanding their their jazz taste. Does that mean the uh, prices of those early pressings are kind of the inverse, where it's like those are continuing to kind of like skyrocket in price those are they ain't making any more of them so <laughs> the, the first mono if it's clean that's an asset and it's i don't see it going down anytime soon because that's a very good point it is the inverse i think a lot of that stuff mm-hmm. has gone way up i mean like i was talking about those specifically um those black jazz records i mean they're i mean i remember them being 30 40 50 bucks and now they're 100 150 200 bucks and it's just wild but they're worth it they're that good but it's just that a lot more people are looking for them now and so i think as people are graduating into some people never get to the point where they're going to spend more than 100 dollars for a record a lot of people i would say most people are that way and that's fine it takes really all types to keep you know the world going around but um but yeah that's a very good point the ones that are really expensive rare jazz records their whole value and 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 going up i think i th- i think from what i've seen and there are some prices that were paid in 2020 um when people had them stimulus checks and they <laughs> they probably paid too much you know 
an auction but i'm like holy crap that's the 200 dollars record and you paid a thousand or whatever so but anyways what do they say uh something's only worth what somebody will pay so but yeah it's been a wild ride and i'm i'm, I'm anxious to see where it, i think it's kind of leveled out now um and everybody was kind of talking about there being this bubble um at that time which there was you know and at some point it was going to pop which i feel like it has but in the end there are way more record collectors now than there were three years ago four years ago there's way more now than there were then even with some people buying and then saying all right covid's over this ain't for me i'm selling my collection like there's still twice as many at least record collectors than there than there was i mean before before 2020 like 2018 2019 it was a pretty weird and niche thing. Now it's like there's mm -hmm. so there's just so many more yeah. people that are regular people doing it, and not a bunch of weirdos. Yeah. They used to. Be. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Good old days. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think I have a good point. I always follow like local market um, buy and sell uh, gear. I see a lot of crappy turntables for sale, but I don't oh, see yeah. people selling their their records along. Yeah, yeah I don't. I don't feel gear, right? Yeah, they probably I don't play the gear and keep the records. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably the same. I hate dealing with gear. I got to stick to what I know. Gear is confusing, and it's like buying a used car. You don't know where it's been. You know, <laughs> so it's yeah. kind of tough to know. Um, I mean, I know enough to get myself in trouble. So I, I, I don't really mm -hmm. deal with a, with a lot of gear. But um, but anyways, yeah, probably the same with that too for sure. Because people graduate yeah. into different levels and sell off their old stuff all the time. So. I have a so, question. How are like new records selling? Like like from pop artists and stuff. Do you see a lot of young people coming into your shop and buying, you know, Taylor yeah. Swift and Ariana Grande's and that sort of thing? Yeah. Um. So, one of the things, the best things that has happened to me in the past year, is I hired this guy who's our. His name's Logan. He's our manager now, and he takes care of all that stuff. So I, <laughs> I do not. I just it's hard for me to really get into things that I don't care about. Um, mm -hmm. So like there is new music that I care about. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like when you're talking about the new Sean Mendez record or whatever, I don't have any frame of reference. I have no idea. I can't guess the market or anything like that. And this guy knows all that stuff. He can predict really well what's going to sell, what's not, want, what's not. And so he, thank God. He's the one who's in control of all that stuff. So he reorders everything every week. He, he makes sure that we have what we need and we don't have too much of it, you know? So, but there is that stuff. There's people coming in all the time that um, the kids that come in and they're like, you know, do you have this? Taylor Swift is just like an anomaly. The amount of records that we sell of hers and everybody sells of hers. Listen, that's the Barbara Streisand uh, dollar bin records of the future. I promise. <laughs> I promise you. I promise. You. Uh, oh yeah, it's super popular. I mean, the they're they're making such a ridiculous amount of these records, and they're getting bought at such a ridiculous pace. I'm just saying, man. I mean, 30 years from now, you're gonna walk into a dollar bin. It's gonna be like God. All this Taylor Swift. You know. So I mean, it's. Yeah. I mean. Who knows? Then there may still be a huge fan base for it. I don't know, but um, she's kind of one of those famous people. Like, there's only been a few of, like Michael Jackson and Elvis, and she's on that level of fame that is just unbelievable. But you know, Elvis records, most of them aren't worth anything now. You know, certain ones are obviously, but most of those yeah. '70s comps or whatever, you know, they're they in the '90s people were looking for them, they were valuable, and now they're not. So, anyways, yeah. I can't remember. Kind of like Buddy Holly, right? I mean, like his records were yeah. insanely expensive at one point. And I think you were talking about that with Mike mm -hmm. on, on an interview that you did with him, uh, which I loved that part of it where he was talking about it's crazy because, um, like, there's this one old guy that I'll go to his house. He lives in the mountains a couple hours from me. And he has, like, you could tell, like, probably in the 90s, he had one of the best collections ever. Like, he had all the Buddy Holly, all the Elvis, all the. But like he still has the books, you know, that have never changed because mm -hmm. they're the same books. Um, and so he thinks that those records are worth a ton. And he's like, be careful with those, you know, and I don't even look at them or buy them or anything because what used to be a three hundred dollar record is now like a forty fifty dollar record. So a lot of the the reason for that is a lot of the um, 
heavy collectors for that stuff that were willing to pay big money were the people that were, they had disposable income at the time. It was important to them when they were young, but now they're so they're getting older and some of them are dying off to where they're not collecting that stuff. They don't care anymore. You know, and so that makes you wonder in 20 years, are all these Led Zeppelin records going to be worthless? You know, you, you don't know what's going to be mm-hmm. worthless. Well, you know, with that jazz, you know, like just to point out like Blue Note, that has kind of held its value over the years, it seems like. It's almost like a timeless thing, um, almost like a like a archival thing in some cases with these original pressings. If people you know want to keep them in their collection or not, I think um, it, it seems like those those pressings have done pretty well. And I think that, I think it's it, it's just it, it's a little different. I don't know exactly what it is, but do you have any uh, thoughts I, on that? I, I, I think just think... yes, just to compliment you, and then you can go. I, I think just that's this historical view, right? It kind of defined a country, a culture. I think that goes beyond just being cool music. What do you think? I think that um, jazz is unique in that, and like you know, also blues is kind of unique in that. Blues is not quite as fancy as jazz. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Jazz, you can envision someone listening to jazz who's drinking some fine wine and all that stuff. Blues, you're sitting there drinking black coffee. You know, it's just good. <laughs> but jazz is fancy. People spend money on fancy. I don't know. Uh, that's yeah. that's probably a dumb analogy, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, jazz is um, a lot. People that are very sophisticated that have a lot of money. Um, that's a stereotype, obviously. But it, you know, a lot of the jazz collectors. Ha, you know, either have money or will have money. They're more sophisticated listeners and things like that who probably are willing to pay more money for something that's higher quality. So what you're saying, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, jet, Blue Notes and stuff like that, they, I mean, in the 90s, they didn't go for nearly what they go for now. Yeah, um, that's true. Now I think people are realizing how important to culture those records are. And um, I don't think that'll ever really go away, you know. Um, you know, I guess you could say that about Buddy Holly too. Like people with Buddy Holly and Elvis, like they're very important to the culture of of mainstream rock and roll, I guess. But it's just different with jazz, and there's so f- fewer out there, you know. As far as like clean blue note records, there's just not that many out there. As far as like you know, you think about clean Buddy Holly records or Elvis records, yeah, they're hard to find. But the clean blue note stuff is just they just didn't make as much of it. There's not as much out there. And um, I think, like I said, people are now are really, uh, and I, everybody, I mean, people always knew how important to culture those records were, but now I feel like more people are realizing it and realizing how cool of an era that was. And so, you know, like I said, they're not making any more of them. So I, I do think that people that are investing in rare jazz records, I think that they will hold that. I really think they'll hold value and go up. I mean, personally, I think they will, but we'll yeah. have to see. <laughs> if there's a zombie right. apocalypse, they won't. If there's a zombie yeah. apocalypse, you know. So we, good weapon we, we're we're the the pandemic. I mean, you know, yeah. who knows what's going to happen. Exactly. That's um, the only way, though. If that's the only way out. Yeah. Other going up. <laughs> Apocalyptic. Um, so, Dylan, we've been going now for over an hour. We want to thank you for coming and hanging out with us. This was a thrill. Um, and uh, and you're welcome back anytime. We're really looking forward to what you're doing with uh, your reissue series. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. Um, and if there's any local jazz albums down there, hopefully those those come up and they're really good. You could put those out. But uh, but yeah, um, hopefully we can do this again. And uh, guys, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I just appreciate you coming on, man, and appreciate the work you do. Um, one thing we didn't really talk about that much, but I, I did want to touch on real quick is. It seems like with your shop, you've really built a culture around it. And like when you do the flip through videos, just like, hey, this stuff's going to the shop first. So your local customers have a chance to get those records instead of just going online. And I think that's amazing. I wish I had a shop like that here. But I really appreciate the the, the work you do on YouTube for all of us. And then I think it's really neat how you've, you've built that with your shop. Well, I think, thank you. That's what I, that's really what I've tried to do because, um, you can sell records online to strangers you don't know, and it's not 
what what we like about records, right? The backstory of it, the tangibility you hold in your hands, what it boils down to is the experience you have with that thing. And there's so many memories I have of going into record stores. And what's just almost as valuable as the record itself is the experience and meeting interesting people and finding it in person. That finding it in person is an intangible, something you cannot replicate, you know, mm-hmm. finding a record in person. And if you're going to sell it either way, why not make it fun? You know, I mean, people come in the shop and I see people coming in and they say, I have been looking for this record for 10 years and here it is in my hand. That is so rewarding and it's not monetary or whatever. And I can tell you right now, if I started throwing all this stuff on whatnot, I would make twice as much money. But um, the community that is there, the customers are great. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I bought the same record two and three times. You know, like I just bought a collection from somebody who bought almost everything they have for me. So mm-hmm. I bought that collection twice, you know, if you think about it. But um mm-hmm. But but more than that, from it being just from a business standpoint, you know, when I when I built the shop, I thought if I could have a record store that the staff was approachable, they were really nice people. um, They looked out for their local customers. They created an experience to where because one of the huge, most driving factors of record collecting is the experience of digging, the experience of finding it yourself, all that stuff, you know. There, you can't put a price tag on that. It's a special thing, and it's more than money. It's more than all that. It's um, I just do it because I like. I, that's the way I like to do it. And people get really mad at me about it. And they, they, all these nasty Instagram. Why would you post it on Instagram if you're not going <laughs> to sell it online? Like, because my customers follow me on Instagram, you know. But, but, mm. but that, that also. I'm not meaning to build all the hype of people saying, I want to go to Noble Records. I want to go to Noble Records. But when you're there, it's an experience. And, you know, Logan that works there, he's the full-time guy. He's working right now. He works really hard to make sure when people come in there, they feel like they can ask questions. They feel like it's a special place. And a lot of people come in there and they're like, you know, this is just a a really special shop. And that's really what I've wanted to build and, and, you know, beyond money and all that stuff. It's, it's people that they it's like part of my heart, really. It's like part of what I love about music and records and all that stuff. And I want to share that with people um, because it's such a special part for me in my life. And anyways, that's a long story, but we love doing it that way. And I, I like that people like you can see that and appreciate mm-hmm. what that means. You know, I've been to a lot of shops that they sell all their good stuff online. And then the rest of the stuff is just like, you know, we call it, <laughs> mm-hmm. I've never told anybody this, but me and Logan call it six ninety nine jazz. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. cheap, cheap, like, Stuff that's like you know, I don't know. I'm not going to call out any six name. No, jazz. don't don't do it. Cheap <laughs> jazz that um that we know that, what you mean. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. You go to a record store, go find a jazz record six nine nine. It's Jimmy Smith stuff. You get it. But um, <laughs> but anyway, so we try to make sure that that uh people can they see the uh, they appreciate being able to look at it in person and all that stuff. But anyways, we like it. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, but I'm yeah. interested in having me on your uh, your show. I've not done a lot of interviews, like I said, but I um, I like doing them. So, any more questions? I'm open. I'm an open book. Cool. Sounds no, good. just just wrapping up, Jill. Um, I think what you said absolutely make uh, is true. I was actually going to touch on the subject. I mean, you um, your brick and mortar shop is way more active than your own i don't see you selling much stuff online besides your 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 releases you know and i think that kind of fosters and it's good for the community or locals everybody i mean at some point you want to keep that culture people going to the store and shopping chatting about it i go to my local store weekly i spend like three hours there at least just chatting you know yeah. and listening to yeah. new things because at the end of the day internet's great but uh the customer service is bots right Hi, I'm Sean or whatever, you know, you know, yeah. no talking to a person, they don't, they don't, they don't care about you. So we, we got to keep stars going on. I think you're taking the great approach, great, great approach. Well, there's things I really like about record collecting and there's, there's, there's different sides of it, but you know, the first main big thing was record shops. I love going to record shops. I love having a record shop and I wanted to get that going to where I wanted it before I really took off the label now the label is a different thing. So there's a lot of people that watch my YouTube channel and they follow me online and they say, we want to support you, support your shop, you know, and 
So I was like, how can I sell records to these people? Cause they want to support me and I work really hard at this. So that's where the label stuff comes in. The exclusives come in there. Anybody around the whole entire world can order from our website and get something from us that, you know, has our logo on it. It's something that's, that's personal came from us. And so that's kind of the goal with the label is I do acknowledge that there are people that can't come to the shop um, that will never be able to come to the shop. And so I want to have something available that they're able to support the shop if they appreciate what we do. And that's why we put out, you know, the exclusives on all that stuff. It's, it's multifaceted. The, why I do it, I get the records out there, people are able to support the shop, all that stuff. And then also we do an auction once a, once a week on whatnot. So I, I pull together a handful of cool records and I can do a live stream and sell things to people. It's a, a, a little extra source of income, income and then people can, interact with me and buy stuff. So I try, but that's as far as I'm really willing to go with it because there's, there's only, there's just, um, it takes all that stuff takes a lot of time and, you know, records sell themselves in the shop. So it's, exactly. it's good. They're going to sell you the way. Why not have them just throw them out there? And go. <laughs> you know, but anyways, but yeah, we, we, we like what we do. And I think, um, we're lucky now there's a lot of really good record stores around a lot of record stores that aren't, they don't have an owner that's on YouTube blabbing about God knows what that, but they are <laughs> doing a really good job that are, um, you know, I could have a friend in Asheville that has a really great shop um, that he puts his heart and soul into it. And he's not online, you know, all this stuff. So anyways, there's a lot of shops around. So the, the record stores, you know, the lifeblood of the record store is a local customer. That's why I keep them happy. They bring me trades. It's a great relationship. But also, you know, record stores are the lifeblood of any community that you have if you're collecting records. So support your local record stores. <laughs> so, <Absolutely. yeah. laughs> but, All right. With that, I think we're going to wrap it up. So yeah. thank mm -hmm. you for coming and hanging out with us. Uh, for everyone watching, thanks for hanging in there, too. Remember to like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Let us know what you think about this. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, we'll see you next time, Dylan. Thank you so much.